Oh. Am I turning up? Thank you. All right, it's a truly a great pleasure to be here. Uh, ICAP was the conference that my PhD advisors always wanted to go to and eventually did, and I've sent postdocs previously. I've never been uh, due to the photon in the title there, so I've spent a lot of the week feeling a little bit like the dog here, um, kind of a little bit out of place. Uh, day 33, they still suspect nothing, but I think I've blown my cover now. So let's go back. I'm a photon guy, I'm proud. Um, this is work done at the University of Queensland in Australia, funded by the Australian government through its Centres of Excellence scheme. Um, you're getting to see me, but the people who do the work are these great PhD and postdocs. Uh, they're from all over the world, and it's normally a pretty happy lab, it <laughs> except it turns out World Cup time, it gets a little tense. Um, Today I'll be talking on something called boson sampling, and that was a collaboration driven by Matthew Broom when he was a PhD student, and Alessandro Fedrizzi, great postdoc, Tim Ralph, Saleh Rahimi Kishari, uh, theorists at UQ, and Scott Aronson and Justin Dover, a summer student at MIT. And the quantum dot work is a collaboration with Pascal Senelard in France and uh, Olivia Gazzano, her then PhD. Okay. Uh, so, uh, simulating quantum systems goes back to Feynman. Many of you know these stor uh, this story. For those of you who don't, he had a great paper in 82 where he said, look, we know perfectly how to solve any quantum system. We just solve Schrodinger's equation. The problem is the number of equations blows up exponentially with the number of particles. But if you think about this, this is odd because Mother Nature herself has no problem with quantum mechanics. So maybe the problem is not the physics, maybe the problem is the computers. Perhaps we should have computers that are computationally using quantum components themselves. Uh, the paper's a PDF, it's easy to find. Go do it, it's full of sketches of single photons and pieces of calcite, which as Alain showed is what the old parts of my lab look like. So it's very cute. Um, it came out and it's fair to say that pretty much for 15 years, nothing happened. And nothing happened until Seth Lloyd's, ah, before that. When you read the paper, it's not clear whether he's talking about emulation or simulation. Uh, to give you an example outside of quantum mechanics, just say you wanted to fly anywhere in the world in four hours. This is something that Australians obsess about a little bit. You need a scramjet engine. Uh, that's got to work at thousands of kilometers an hour or thousands of meters a second, some high speed and high temperatures. So this is a shock tunnel. Uh, you build it, you do a fast flow, you put objects in there, and then you take a physical measurement that gives you a physical quantity. This is an emulator. Here the measurement is an interferometric hologram and you can pull out I, what's that, density and electron concentration of the flow. And that's fine, it works very well, but if you see something unexpected, maybe the flow is coming off at an angle you weren't expecting, you don't know, will that really happen in the upper atmosphere, or is that due to the fact that my dump tank wasn't big enough and there's some problem with my emulator? So you also build a simulator, and a simulator is a digital model that gives you a physical quantity, and you play those two off against one another until you're happy that what you're seeing in your lab will happen in the real world. That's true in classical physics, it will be true in quantum physics. Um, there's no digital error correction for your emulator, which is why you've got this verification issue. You do have error correction, of course, in your digital model, but there's still a verification issue. Did you pick the right Hamiltonian to program in? You've got to compare that to experiment, which ties back to that last question of Alain's. Um, in the quantum regime, it's known that there's a scalability advantage for simulators. For emulators, that's something of an open question. Okay, so there was a question at the end of the last talk on Monday about what do you mean by quantum, so let's just deal with that for a second. Uh, my example for this is Zitterbewegung. This is the trembling motion of a relativistic electron. Schrodinger predicted it after uh, basically eyeballing the Dirac equation because he was very clever. Um, it looks like this. I was talking to Alain about it this morning and he could not pronounce Zitterbewegung, so I said, don't worry about it, Alain, just think of it as electron twerking. Okay, it's just... <laughs> Also, oscillatory motion as you go along. Okay, the frequency is very fast, 10 to the 21 hertz. The amplitude's very small, it's 10 to the minus 12 meters, so it's never been observed. But a few years ago, people realized the Dirac equation has the same form as the uh, non-relativistic Schrodinger equation, and that you can emulate in the lab. So Rainer Blatt's group did that with an iron trap. Uh, just to give you an idea of the size of things, single iron, and they saw the Zeta Bewegung motion. Fantastic paper, that was in 2010. Same year, it was done in optics with a series of waveguides by um, Alex Zamite's group in Jena. And they also saw the oscillatory motion. That was a classical simulation because they used laser beams and square law detectors. But if they'd used single photons and photon counters, it would have been a quantum simulation. But they would have seen exactly the same results. And then last year, it was done uh, with neutral atoms. And in all three cases, the phenomena, Zitterbewegung, is a single particle phenomena. 
you could do it with water waves. Right? It's more surprising um, if you're doing it with ions or neutral atoms, because you don't really think of those as being that oscillatory. With light, you kind of look at it and go, well, that's not so surprising. It's a PRL, not a nature paper. But you have to decide, what is it of interest? Is it the phenomena? Is it the physics of the emulator or the simulator? Or is it some combination of both? Because in particular, in recent years, people have started looking at things in this emulation space and saying, well, we'll, we'll build systems there and then take it to non-trivial things uh, in quantum biology, et cetera. And I'm not going to talk more about that, but uh, I have a slide prepared for question time with a big pile of them, cow dung, uh, if, it, if there's any questions. So in photons, since this is a photon talk, um, with, uh, early work was done on emulation with quantum walks. There'd been phenomena, a topological uh, phenomena predicted in uh, condensed matter physics and in high energy physics that had never been observed in the lab. There was a theory paper by Rudner's group in 2010 that said, look, you can take the Hamiltonian, turn it into unitary evolution in a quantum walk. Uh, we did that in the lab. Uh, the normal quantum walk is shown on the top right. Things walk out as you go. If you have different topologies, however, uh, the light gets trapped in the middle of the walk, just like the uh, conductance states on a topological insulator. And that was the first confirmation of these robust bound states. But you don't have any scaling advantage, so, so let's move to something where you do, quantum simulation. Okay, so we go back to Feynman's thing. Uh, great paper, 16 years, nothing happened. Okay, until Lloyd's paper came along in 96. Note the title, Universal Quantum Simulators. It was all about digital. And Lloyd said, Feynman was right. You take any physical system, or a wide class of them, you digitize it into a number of qubits, send it through some unitary evolution, which is your perfect quantum computer you got off the shelf from um, Walmart or somewhere. And at the output, you get a variety of qubits uh, that you can read, and that gives you to arbitrarily good approximation the answer to the problem you're after. Uh, I read that paper as a PhD student. I got really excited. I thought, great. What's the first test example we can do? And I had nothing. And in fact, no one had anything until um, Alan and Peter Love came up. This was, by the way, this is a paper from the first year of Alan's postdoc. It's just amazing. And he said, look, the eigenvalue problem of chemistry, you can map onto the phase estimation problem that quantum computers solve, and you can do molecular energies, you can do reaction rates, and we just heard in the talk all the kind of things you can do. So we built a little two-qubit quantum computer, um, ran it up to 47 bits of accuracy. We didn't need to. By 20 bits, we're at the so-called chemical precision that Alain talked about. Just think of it as close enough for government work. It agrees to about six parts in a million. Um, there are hundreds of data points. It fit very well. Philip Volta's group the next year built a brilliant, frustrated Heisenberg spin system. Those four white balls there are meant to be the, the molecule they were uh, emulating. Uh, they had seven data points, not one of which lay on the line. Now, is that because Philip's a bad experimentalist, tempted as I am to say no. No, he's a very good experimentalist. But this is a problem with photons. Photons, as you go from two to four, have decreased signal and increased noise. Okay? Um, and I'll come back to that more in the talk. This is the kind of circuit you build. Notice two things about it. The top thing is there's a single control qubit, comes in zero, gets put into superposition of zero, one, and there's a register that you program, and then you throw away, and then you read out the top qubit. Um, this I'm going to skip through, but basically there's a, a, a recipe for how you take your Hamiltonian and slice and dice it into small pieces to turn it into a unit, unitary evolution. And our theory colleagues have basically laid out the next 10, 20 years of when you've got your working computer, here's the circuit you build to do this bit of quantum chemistry. To do hydrogen properly without cheating needs six qubits, or it did up until this week. I don't know with the papers it might have changed. Um, and it needs, a, so the y-axis here is the error measured in heart trees, because chemists don't know what a joule is. And the x-axis is the total number of gates. And uh, let's see if I can get this pointer working. Um, this point here is the chemical precision line. So if you have about 600 gates and 6 qubits, you'll have done the first no compromises quantum chemistry simulation. Uh, there was this fantastic poster by Cornelius Hempel on Monday night where he showed they had a string of 20 entangled ions. Okay? In the same system, they've done about 100 plus gates. So in answer to your question, Philip, um, I'm pretty sure that there'll be the first complete quantum chemistry simulation within five years with ions. It won't be photons. But I'm talking to you about photon simulation. So what am I going to do next? Well, um, chemists, go back to your little beakers and tubes, sweetie. This is a physics conference. What happened earlier? 
What do you study? One atom. How about you? Two. Um, <laughs> sometimes three. Ugh, biologist. Okay, the logical progression here from three to two to one is now I'm going to talk about no atoms. Um, so I'm going to do maths. Okay. All right. So Shaw's factoring algorithm, many of you know about it. It's basically an efficient way, if I give you a large composite number, to find the prime constituents of it. Uh, a young bloke called Scott Aronson, in his PhD thesis, pointed out something that I now call Aronson's trilemma. He said, look, just the fact that it exists, not the fact that anyone's built it or done anything interesting with it, just the fact that it exists, means one of three things must be true. The first thing is that the extended Church-Turing thesis, which is the basis of all computer science, is wrong. This is the Church-Turing thesis. All computational problems that are efficiently solvable are efficient, uh, by physical devices are efficiently solvable by a Turing machine. It doesn't bother me that that's wrong. I'm an experimental physicist. But Michael Nielsen pointed out it plays the same role in computer science that Galilei and Newton played in physics. And in fact, if you talk to computer scientists my age or older, they do not believe it is wrong. They think there's something wrong with quantum computing. And this has real-world effects. A billion euro alternative computing project in Europe a couple of years ago was killed because it had a small 100 million euro component on quantum computing. And the computer science referees came in and said, nothing wrong with the church Turing thesis, kill the whole lot. And maybe they're right. Maybe the problem is the realistic physical devices. Um, uh, actually, let me go back a bit. So Paul Davies has published a paper where he says a 399 qubit quantum computer will work but a 400 qubit quantum computer will not work because it exceeds the holographic black hole membrane something, information capacity. It sounded like bulldust to me. I've no idea. <laughs> Maybe he's right. The only way to find out is to try and build it. And this is what Scott Aronson says here. The only way to find out if a quantum computer will work is to try and build it. If it doesn't work, that'll be fascinating. And he says it on theoretical grounds. And I've got to say, as an experimentalist, I would take great comfort just how cool would it be if you had a 399 qubit quantum computer and it was working, and you added one more qubit and it stopped working and it was the universe's fault. That would be awesome. <laughs> it's normally my fault. Okay. A third possibility is that a fast classical factoring algorithm exists. So for years when I gave this slide, I put up this quote. Lots of math mathematicians have looked and think it can't be done. And lots of stuff is now based on the impossibility of doing it. And I would say, apologies for the self-quote, but it's impossible to find something interesting said by a mathematician. Um, and that was true. And then uh, until Peter Love pointed out that he was talking to Peter Sarnak, who's the editor of uh, Acta Mathematica at Princeton, a very respected mathematician, who said, I love Shaw's algorithm because it proves to me that a fast classical factoring algorithm must exist. Peter got very excited. He said, well, you know, what's your intuition? What are your details? He said, oh, I've got none. It just must. Maybe. OK. All three of those things seem crazy to computer scientists, theoretical physicists, mathematicians. But at least one of them must be true. So it's win-win for an experimentalist, because it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to upset somebody. OK? <laughs> and the second half of this talk will be how we experimentally test this trilemma. OK, a universal quantum computer is defined as something that's universal for a class of problems, BQP, bounded quantum polynomials. It's been known for about 10 years that you need entanglement, more than 10 years, to solve these things. And it's also been known that a small amount of entanglement is not enough. It's got to grow in a certain size with the instance that you're trying to solve. In fact, more recently, it's known that too much entanglement is a problem. It's quite a narrow path you're trying to hit. Pardon me. But there are no such proofs for mixed states. And that has led to a new class of quantum computers, something called intermediate quantum computers. The granddaddy of them all, now these are ones that will not, they're not universal, but they all solve problems efficiently that we have no efficient classical solution for. The granddaddy of them all is something called deterministic quantum computing with one pure qubit. Uh, it solves a whole bunch of problems efficiently, and my favorite being the Jones polynomial and not theory, it's just so unlikely. But the circuit, if you look at it, looks a lot like the quantum chemistry circuit. There's a control qubit driving a unitary that you measure, except now instead of a carefully programmed uh, series of qubits and eigenvalue, you send in complete noise. It's just a series of mixed qubits, and you throw them away. That's as close to useless as you could imagine. And certainly when it was first proposed, I argued with the authors, uh, Canil and Laflamme, saying, You've just, this is nonsense, it won't work. I was wrong. We did an experiment a few years ago where we did, again, a two-qubit instance. If you see fringes, there's an advantage over the classical. When alpha, which is one for a pure state, was close to one, we saw fringes. As we turned it down, we still see fringes. 
And as alpha goes arbitrarily close to zero, as long as it doesn't go to zero, you still get an exponential advantage, even though there's zero entanglement. Um, it turns out it's strongly correlated with something called discord, and that's a whole other story. Um, I commend to you this uh, nice overview article in Nature from 2011 on that. Um, but there's a bunch of other problems like this, these intermediate quantum computers, temporally unstructured quantum computers, permutational quantum computers, and boson sampling. And if you talk to complexity theorists, they have a well-founded suspicion that all of these things are interrelated. And they're completely different physical systems. Some are spins, some are photons. Um, there's, there's no physics in common. But they, they think there's something, some kind of deep uh, interrelation. So studying one might throw light on another. So let me take you to boson sampling. This is the problem. I've got some unitary circuit. I'm going to throw in some quanta, and I'm going to ask what happens at the output. Do they all come out one mode, or are they evenly distributed, or are they clumped, or, or, or whatever? Can I model that with a quantum computer? You can model anything with a quantum computer. If I have, say, three quanta into six modes, then I'll need six qtrits. If I've only got a qubit quantum computer, then I'll need 12 qubits. And that unitary, that's an arbitrary unitary, randomly chosen from the Haar measure, so it's got no structure. So I need this scaling, so I'm going to need about a billion gates. But I could do that. If I wanted to do 10 photons into 100 modes, which is not hard, uh, that's 100 uh, q-dents, which is about 400 qubits, but I'll need 10 to the 246 gates. So there's two take-home messages from this. One, don't use a quantum computer if you've got no structure to the problem. And two, photons are not qubits. Okay? So. No, I can't use a quantum computer, but I can do the following. I can take that unitary and keep only the parts where I'm throwing in quanta, in this example, in modes 1, 2, and 4, and keep only the parts where I'm going to do measurements. Arbitrarily, I'm only going to measure in modes 1, 2, and 3. And that gives me a submatrix, and that's got everything I need to know. That's got all the probability amplitudes, and now I just have to do one piece of maths on that submatrix, and I'm done. I've got the answer to the problem. And for fermions, that piece of maths is take the determinant plus minus plus minus, you can use a row reduction method. That's computationally efficient. It uh, scales as n cubed, so a lower order polynomial. People will be happy, Alan. Um, and it's in complexity class P. That's fermions, which I was taught in undergraduate are the hard quantum particle. You know, bosons are the easy quantum particle. But if I send bosons through this, I have to calculate something called the permanent, which is just plus, plus, plus. And that blows up as n factorial, worse than exponential. It's not e to the n, it's n to the n. So it's in complexity class sharp p, and that's strongly believed to be classically intractable. OK. Um, so when this was first pointed out, people had a rush of blood to the head, and they thought, oh, maybe we can use bosonic, photonic things and solve hard problems, maybe sharp p or maybe even just less hard np complete problems. Um, it, and it is true, the device outputs the probability amplitude, which is the permanent. But what you measure is the complex square. And when you do that, you lose exactly enough information that there's no computational gain. And that's a really interesting kind of censorship or something that's going on. No one's got an explanation for that, but I find it very interesting. All right, that's if I want to know everything that's going on. Even if I want to know just the simpler problem of how often do I see one photon at each output port. That's a much simpler problem. It turns out that is also in complexity class sharp p. That's also a factorially difficult problem. Um, so uh, Aronson and Arkhipov's main result is that if you can build a classical computer that can do the same thing as this quantum circuit, then something called the polynomial hierarchy of computer science collapses. Um, that's my mental image because I don't understand it. But it basically means the basis of the field for the last 40 years is gone, and everything that everyone has done up until is wrong, and they have no idea where to go next. And for details, there's a book for sale out at Cambridge University Press outside, which I really do recommend, Quantum Computing Since Democritus. OK. Um, the way to check this is to do a large-scale boson sampling experiment. And if you find that, yes, it's much faster than a classical computer, this is the strongest experiment evidence you're going to get that the extended Church-Turing thesis is incorrect. And you can shut up some old computer scientists, which is always worthwhile. Large scale is about 20 to 30 photons into 4 to 900 modes. OK, where are we in the lab? We're not there. Uh, so here's the challenge. I'm going to have a classical computer scientist and a quantum computer scientist. And I'm going to have them each a black box unitary. 
the classical computer scientist has to measure the unitary. It's a black box. They don't know what it is. But then once they've measured it, they calculate the permanent like I talked about before. The quantum computer scientist just sends some photons through, uh, measures how often they come out in the target mode, for example, one in each mode, pardon me, and calculates a probability from the relative frequency. So who wins as I go to large things? Well, from everything I've said, clearly the quantum computer scientist. Yes, except we don't know in the real world what are the effects of mode mismatch and photon loss and, and all the other things that go wrong in an experiment. So we wanted to do a small experiment and see is this a robust protocol or not. Now, particularly for this audience, which boson? Any boson will do. Neutral atoms, phonons and ion traps, bosonized fermions, superconductors, anything. We did photons because A, we're a photon lab and they also have the best coherence of any boson in large networks. But if you wanted to scale this and you want to try and beat the photon guys and you're a neutral atoms or an ion uh, group, come talk to me afterwards because we've got ideas. Okay, um, in our lab, uh, this is the kind of thing that the classical computer scientist measures. They, there's an efficient way of measuring the unitary. I won't go into details of that, um, but it was invented by a young PhD student, Rahimi Kashari, and it was great because it was a problem that all the other groups hadn't been able to solve. And over coffee one day, he said, why are you looking depressed? I said, I've got this problem. And he said, oh. And he solved it over the best cup of coffee I've ever bought for someone in my life. Uh, so if, uh, hire him if he's on the market. OK. Um, you can use that unitary if you're the classical computer scientist to calculate probabilities. But the problem with probabilities is they get affected by detector inefficiencies. And they're different detector to detector. Better to calculate the visibilities. If two photons arrive at a different time, they have one rate as if they arrive at a beam splitter at the same time, where they coalesce, bo bosonic coalescence, we call that hongo mandel interference, but it's just bosonic coalescence, that gives you a different rate, and the difference between those two rates gives you something we call the non-classical visibility. And when you calculate that, that takes out the detector inefficiencies. Um, how do you build the unitary? There were four groups last year did experiments on that. Uh, our group, Ian Walmsley's group at Oxford, um, Philip Volta's group in Vienna, and uh, Fabio Schiarano's group in Italy, um, they all did them different ways, all of them quite legitimate. We did the simplest, um, which it involves the fact that it, it was a three-mode uh, fiber coupler, which the manufacturer sells to as non-polarizing, but if you've ever used one, you know that, in fact, they lie, and it's strongly polarizing. So we took advantage of the fact that it was polarizing and turned it into a six-by-six six tunable device. It's not infinitely tunable, but you can tune it over a very large range, so you can make it go from something that's kind of an equal splitter to something that's quite an unequal beam splitter. Um, uh, that's the 15 visibilities if I'm sending two photons in that a quantum computer scientist would measure. There's kind of little dark bars, top and bottom. They're the errors. Um, that's the 15 visibilities that the classical computer scientist would predict. And again, they've got error bars as well. Remember, that's based on their measurement of the unitary. And you want to see, did the two things overlap? And so we did that. How am I going? Whoa, geez. OK, uh, oh, I'm in trouble. Uh, we did that, two photons, three photons. But when you zoom in, you see that they don't agree to within error. And that's a really horrific thing for an experimentalist. What's going on? And it has to do with these higher order photon terms. We use down conversion, and it's a spontaneous process. And sometimes, instead of producing one photon in each mode, it gives you two photons in each mode. So that brings me to the challenges for photonic simulation. We want good. Uh, photon sources, good detectors, uh, good circuits. Detectors is a solved problem. You can now, for money and influence, get uh, photon number resolving, efficient, fast, quiet detectors, and broadband. You can't get any one detector that's all of these things, but you can get close. And people have used them to solve all kinds of interesting problems. Um, networks is becoming a rapidly solved problem. Uh, we heard in Alain's talk that you can do it with uh, surface mount, or you can come in with a strong laser beam. We've got collaborations where you write it into a glass block. You can tune them to make sure unitary is hard to sample. Um, they're not as low loss as free space, but they're getting there. So that brings us to photon sources. Uh, down conversion is the gold standard, but we know everything about it, but it's dreadful because its efficiency is about 10 to the minus 4%, and it, some of the time it gives you more than two photons. So you need much better sources. Um, we've already heard a bit about this at this conference. This is uh, nano wires, nano pillars, micro pillars. We heard on Monday about photonic band gap, that's uh, waveguides or cavities from Ido Wax's group. They all couple very well into waveguides. The beta is how well you couple. And then you, how well you can extract that out 
Uh, for the uh, micro pillars, it's about 40% efficiency. That was Pascal Senelar's group. She had pairs of micro pillars to make entangled photons. Um, we went to her and said, can you knock one off and double the mirror at the bottom, which she did, and we got nearly 80% extraction efficiency. Uh, we use that, and it's a true single photon source. We use that to do some linear optic stuff because that's what we do. But what we're really interested in doing now and what we're doing at the moment is we're driving it with N pulses in a row and switching it quickly into N spatial modes because we really want to do hard boson sampling and we can't do it with down conversion. So our hope is by the next ICAP, uh, seven order of magnitude improvement in the 10 photon rate, which by the way, the 10 photon rate at the moment is once per year. So we're going to try and get to hertz. Okay. Um, Okay, of course, I really want to do quantum chemistry. My undergraduate was chemistry and physics. I'm not going to get there with linear optics, so I need nonlinear interactions. The quantum dots, as we heard from Ido Wax's talk, is the way to go, I think. But in the meantime, we've been looking at doing narrowband photons in uh, rubidium filled uh, hollow core photonic band gap fibers. And with weak coherent states, we're getting about 0.13 microradians per photon. That's not as good as Gaeta's group, is getting 0.3 milliradians per photon but we are getting photon-photon nonlinear interactions. Ours, because it's a big fiber, it doesn't clog up, you can run it 24 hours. Um, Sash's, because it's a smaller fiber, works for an hour, clogs up with rubidium, and then you've got to pump on it with a laser and for 23 hours to clear it out. Okay, so the take home messages are, as a technical one, which is we experimentally verified that these boson scaffolding processes are robust against the kind of losses you get in the lab. Stepping back a bit, I hope I've convinced you that photonic quantum simulators are capable of solving a hard problem, something with unusually big scaling. And thirdly, I guess photonics is back in the game. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and ask if there's any questions. Thank you. So much. We have time for a few questions. Well, Andrew, you said a lot of really wonderfully inflammatory things during your talk. I, I, I know I, that was exactly your intention. Indeed. Uh, and one of the inflammatory things which you, you highlighted on a single slide was photons are not qubits. That's right. Now, of course, uh, uh, you know, for, for a long time, people uh, thought that, uh, that, that photons were going to be worthless. And then people from Queensland, among other places, uh, taught us, uh, we thought, that, uh, that it was all going to be okay. And now you're telling us uh, well, just what are you telling us? That's what I'm, I want to know. I'm saying it's, it's, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Okay? The, the boson, look, the boson sampling thing was a surprise to us because we thought we'd, we'd, we understood linear networks. KLM came along and said, you know, you use detector, it's nonlinear, and yes, it's not going to scale well, as Philip was pointing out, but you know, this, this, you, you understand what's going on. And the fact that you could just take a handful, literally, of, of photons and scatter it through a very small network and have something that requires 10 to the 246 gates in a quantum computer was a real shock to me. And the answer is photons, which I had always thought of as qubits, are not qubits. I've got to worry about the bosonic coalescence and the Hilbert space blows up very fast. That's also a feature, right? Most of the systems we use aren't qubits. We try really hard to make them look like qubits, but instead of doing that, maybe some of the time we should say, look, can we take advantage of this richer Hilbert space? Is there something we can do? Um, the boson sampling one, one of the criticisms I normally get of it is this. Technically true that every object is an analog computer of itself. Uh, this machine is running a perfect simulation of cheese, and it's running faster than any supercomputer. So one of, the, one of the criticisms of boson sampling is what is it good for? And the answer is nothing. It's not good for quantum chemistry. No, it's good for proving computer scientists wrong, and that's new science, and that's interesting. Um, but it's, it's, it's not good for, you know, quantum chemistry, which is one of the really interesting spaces we want to move into. I have one thing which worries me, because um, the Scott Adamson proof, as far as I understand it, says that if I am here, and yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I was wondering why the computer turned off. That the proof says that if I pick up randomly this unitary, then the problem will be very hard to compute classically. Yes. Now, if you go to large numbers when you will not be able to calculate classically, how can you be sure that you pick up... I know that it should happen with probability one, but still, I know that there are many matrices for which I can calculate uh, permanent in my head, even like unitary, like unit matrix. Identity, matrices, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And close to uh, identity, probably, it's also perturbative methods have, uh, should allow to ca calculate something and things like that. So you have to have first a lot of versality in changing this 
uh, how do you call it, connections or whatever, beam splitters and so on? It, it's an excellent question. So the, it comes back to, you can never disprove the extended church Turing thesis because it's a statement in the asymptotic limit. You can just say it's looking increasingly unlikely. And one of the things you need to be able to do is just randomly pick a bunch of unitaries from over the Haar measure. So you really do want a circuit that's tunable, which is where the, the work of uh, Jeremy O'Brien's that uh, uh, Alan was showing is so good because you can program that up and show that I have randomly picked some things and each one of those instances was difficult. In each one, it was a hard classical computation. There, was, there has been over the past 12 months a lot of discussion and theorists, some people said, um, including Jens Eisert, he said, look, uh, all you're going to produce is basically uniform things and so there's no advantage. And Scott Aronson's research group came back and showed that wasn't true. But it's also true that by the time you get to 30 photons into 900 modes, which I certainly hope on the time scale of how long ICAP has been running, will we'll be there within 20 years you won't be able to check that with a classical computer. So you've only got a small window where you'll be able to check it of between, say, here and 20 or 30 photons. So, and you have to have some confidence in the physical system that you're building, which is why we also wanted to test it with respect to decoherence. Uh, the other thing is it assumes perfect distinguishable photons. We don't have that. What happens when you have somewhat distinguishable photons? And it turns out it's still a hard problem because, in general, the permanent and determinant are special cases of something called the imminent, which I'd never heard of. I'd never heard of the permanent either. Uh, uh, but the hardest thing to calculate is the permanent. And when you have a 30% distinguishable photon, then you can show that, OK, it's still got a component that's hard to calculate. So it'll all come down practically about signal to noise in terms of you need to have enough indistinguishability that you're still getting a signal that is hard to compute and tunability of the devices you build. So there's a lot of engineering to be done. All right, maybe one more question. Something out of back. When you get to these large systems that are impossible to check with a classical computer, are you going to be able to even check them with a reproducing it on another apparatus? Or does it also become so sensitive that you can never reproduce the settings? That's a really good open question. And I don't know the answer to that. What we are hoping to do over the next 18 months is just show scaling. That as we go two, three, four, five, six, as too many photons as we can get from our new source, that the lab experiments take roughly the same time each time and have some repeatability over day-to-day -day settings and that in all cases the classical calculation blows up factorially. But when we get to the very big systems, I don't know the answer and I don't know that anyone else does yet either. There's been a, a lot of, and if you're a theorist by the way, have a look at the literature on this. There's a really, really interesting questions to do with complexity theory and physics that are being raised by this. All right, and I guess on this Wonderful point. We'll thank Andrew and all the other speakers thank for you. a fantastic session.